let go. Cool. So we are here tonight with sleep independent sleep expert, yep. Dr. Neil Stanley. I feel like we need like an applause or something. Don't we? <laughs> um, so how's it going? Thanks for agreeing to talk to us. Oh, it's a great pleasure. All's good. Thank you. Excellent. So we have got a few questions for our yep. members about sleep. Um, so sleep being a very important thing for <laughs> triathletes, but in reality, yep. None of us really truly understand the, the kind of benefits and right. the power of recovery. We're told it's super important. Um, but yeah, hopefully you can kind of explain a little bit more to us. Yeah. So should we jump straight in? Yeah. Ready for me to kick off? Well, ask the doctor. So first question we had is what constitutes a good night's sleep? Start off with the difficult ones. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It is, it is difficult because, you know, as a sleep expert, I've spent my career putting people into a sleep laboratory, wiring them up, uh, and then saying, you know, that was a good night's sleep. But a person might turn around and say, well, I feel exhausted. <laughs> you know, so there is the objective, uh, but there's also the subjective. And very, very simply, a good night's sleep is one that allows you to feel awake, alert, focused, working at a high level the next day. So if, if at 11 o'clock in the morning you feel great, you know, raring to go, full of energy, can concentrate, then you've had enough sleep. You've had a good night's sleep. If you don't have a good night's sleep, you'll feel sleepy during the day. Now, there is a reason for using the word sleepy uh, because a lot of people talk about being tired during the day. Oh, I'm just tired. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's got nothing to do with sleep tired is a state of mind you know depressed miserable I had a row with the wife kicked the cat don't like my job it's raining that's what tired is but if you have a problem with your sleep you'll be sleepy and a lot of people get that confused they think that because they're not feeling you know f happy and great and at peace with the world that they must have a problem with their sleep it's probably just that life isn't great sort of thing um so if you want to know the difference very simply uh if you climb up three flights of stairs when you get to the top do you need a sit down or do you need a sleep if you need a sit down <laughs> you're tired, you're tired, yeah knackered exhausted if you need a sleep then you're sleepy so really that's it i mean essentially sleep a good night's sleep is having long enough sleep of decent quality um, and if you have that, then sleep is the best thing you can do. It makes you feel great, gives you motivation, gives you energy, good for your health, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, so, as I say, we all have a different sleep need. Everybody has a different sleep need. It's not eight hours. It's the amount that allows you to feel awake. So, personally, after 38 years as a sleep expert, I need nine and a half hours sleep to feel at my best. There are some people, very, very small amount of people, maybe 1% of the population, who are genetically able to thrive on four hours sleep. With no <laughs> negative side effects. Other people at the other end need 11 hours to feel at their best. It's about how you feel. That's the important thing. So when I talk to people about sleep, I don't care how long it took you to fall asleep. I don't care how many times you woke up. That's unimportant. What matters to me is how do you feel during the day? It's as simple as that. That's the only metric you really need to use. Interesting. That's very interesting. I think that leads very nicely into the next question. I think you've kind of answered it within that. Um, so it was, what is the optimum number of hours for sleep? Yeah, I mean, as I say, it is, it's something that f gets fixed around the age of somewhere between 20 and 25. You start sleeping your adult sleep pattern. Before that, as a teenager, you actually need more sleep than adults because you're going through puberty, you're going through physical, emotional changes, and they're dealt with during the night. But when you get to around 20, 25, that's it. Your sleep need becomes fixed for life. So old people do not need less sleep. That's another great <laughs> myth. Um, you need the same amount of sleep, but as you get older, it's more difficult to get that sleep. 
So that's the problem that we have as we get older, is your sleep becomes lighter, it's more easily disturbable, and once you are disturbed, you find it very difficult to go back to sleep. When you're 20, you wake up, you go for a pee, you get back into bed, you fall straight back to sleep, <laughs> and if somebody says to you, how was your night, you go, yeah, fine. When, like me, you're 54, you get up for a pee, you get back into bed, and you lie there for the next hour and a half thinking, this is nice. <laughs> um, so there's, there's little pressure for you to go back to sleep. That's, that's the issue with, with as we get older. But I say, it's about giving yourself the amount of sleep you need. If you are, you know, the hypothetical eight-hour-a-night person, if you're only in bed for seven hours a night, you're not going to get eight hours sleep. That's impossible. And that's the problem. We don't give ourselves the time for sleep. So, how, so we think we can get by. We, we compress sleep because, <coughs> excuse me, because talking to your imaginary friends on Facebook or watching funny cat videos on Twitter somehow seems more important than sleep. And so, so sleep is sort of, Sleep's no longer a pleasure. It's no longer, oh, I'm really looking forward to go to bed. It's, oh, I've got to go to bed now, haven't I? It's like, you know, YouTube have just invented an alarm for their system to tell you it's time to go to bed. Are you a child? Can you not work out that it gets past 11 o'clock, you should actually be going to bed? And that's the problem. You, if you don't see sleep as important, you'll never give yourself the time you need to get that sleep and the problem is with that is that we are all going through life feeling a bit rubbish and yet we're we're taking multivitamins we're we're having a glass of wine on a friday night to make us feel better and yet we're not doing the one thing that actually makes you feel better which is getting a good night's sleep and that, <laughs> that's the bizarre thing about it we don't we don't see getting sleep as as an important part of our day even though we all know what we should be doing but we don't do it and so you know people will quote you know Michelangelo Leonardo da Vinci Margaret Thatcher Thomas Edison all these great people who didn't sleep a lot well that's just lies there's no evidence that these people ever slept uh, small amounts uh, it was just propaganda making them sound you know big and clever um, you know uh, Roger Federer sleeps 10 hours a night. Einstein used to sleep 11 hours a night. So I know which way I'm more willing to go, get the sleep yeah. you need. Yeah. Well, see, that interesting. It is very interesting. And and so going back to what you were saying about, about you know, having wine to, about the feeling making yourself feel better, I think certainly for a lot of athletes, um, caffeine is a big, you know, so oh, well, I only got six hours sleep last night, five hours sleep last night, but it's okay. I'll have a cup of coffee, I'll get straight on yeah. the caffeine. That'll give me that lift I need to get through the day. Um, yeah, so I, I mean, guess... That, that, that's a big problem. I mean, that's a big, big problem. Because <clears throat> if you want uh, to recover, to recuperate, to perform well, uh, caffeine's not the way to go for a couple of reasons. One, it only lasts 30 minutes to boost your performance. That performance boost only lasts about 30 minutes. However, the amount of caffeine needed to give you that boost is much more than the amount of caffeine needed to disturb your sleep at night. And the half-life of caffeine can be anywhere up to 10 hours. So for some people, taking a cup of coffee at two o'clock can still be affecting their ability to go to sleep uh, at 10 o'clock at night. So yeah. there's a big problem with caffeine there. The other problem with caffeine is how do you take it? Uh, if you drink coffee, that's pretty much a waste of time because you don't know how much caffeine any cup of coffee has got in it. It may have no caffeine at all. Uh, it depends how long the water has been actually on the grain. Uh, if it hasn't been on the long, so uh, uh, Professor Jim Horn at Loughborough University, he's the guy who did those, you know, the, when you drive along the motorway, you see the signs that says tiredness kills, take a break. Yeah. yeah. The guy who got those implemented. So he, his, his uh, interest is driving and, and alertness. Um, and he went 
to motorway service stations and went to McDonald's and went to Burger King and ordered 10 cups of coffee, consecutive 10 black coffee, bang, 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 straight off the same machine. And then he measured how much caffeine was in it. So it's from exactly the same machine and some of them had zero caffeine. Jeez. So you have two cups of coffee, you've got zero. Some of them had so much caffeine, 400 milligrams, that if you had two cups of that, it's so much caffeine that actually it will be putting you to sleep. Caffeine has an inverted U. So some caffeine will boost you. Too much caffeine actually puts you over the edge and starts putting you to sleep. Oh. So the benefit of caffeine is purely psychological. I've had coffee. You know, I've had caffeine. I can do it. But it does nothing for sleepiness. And if you exercise when you are sleepy, you are a 75% increased risk of suffering a sports-related injury. Uh. So by so you can do it two ways. Either you're sleepy and you exercise, that's foolish, <laughs> or you have caffeine, believe your God, and still exercise <laughs> when you're sleepy. Yeah. And then you get injured. And if you are still not, you know, and if, it, you know, we know, as you alluded to at the start, you know, sleep is very important for recovery, for recovery. If you injure yourself, if you have a sports related injury and you're not sleeping well, you will take much, much longer to recover from that. Yeah. So, you know, there is almost by definition, there is this sort of macho idea of doing exercise if i do exercise you know i am strong the problem is it doesn't work like that your body may be strong but the bit that's affected by sleep is your mind and you know yourself if you're sleepy you become clumsy you trip over things you 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 do things wrongly you you take risks i mean one of the big things about poor sleep is indulging in risky behavior so rather than you know getting the stitch and going i should quit if you're sleepy you know no i can run through this i'll run through the pain well you know pain is god's way of telling you to stop <laughs> it's not meant to be run through it's meant to be obeyed that's why it hurts so this is this is the thing that that all the attitudes that that people who are you know professional athletes are negative to sleep that, that, that mindset is negative almost directly to sleep and sleep is the most important thing you can do. And, and you know, some athletes like Federer um, appreciate the importance of sleep. Jose, Jose Mourinho, uh, when he was at Porto, FC Porto, and that's where he became the star manager. He actually imposed a very strict curfew on his players. Uh, and in the year that he did that, that was the year that Porto won the European. Because he said, you know, that's the important thing. Um, so, you know, it can go to the extreme of, you know, nap rooms. You know, Manchester United have got nap rooms for their players because they're all so exhausted from running around the field for a few minutes. Um, <laughs> that's, a, that's, that's a bit excessive. You don't need that. You don't need to nap if you've had a good night's sleep. Um, but Cherry Ma, who is a researcher at um, Stanford, showed that if you get a good night's sleep, this was in the university basketball team, that if you sleep what you need, so you give yourself the time to sleep what you need naturally. In basketball, your, I can never say this, your three-point throw average goes up, but also your sprinting time is improved by 10%. Now you show me anything that you can do that will improve your sprinting speed by 10%, like that. Yeah? And this is, this is what she, and she also worked with a swimming team showing that you get faster. Worked with a tennis team showing that your accuracy of hitting the ball was massively increased. Uh, and again, your speed was increased by about 10%. So, if you look at professional athletes, they've got the dietitian, they've got the physio, they've got the psychological coach. They, they're done. 
they're as good as they can be, but you're looking for that marginal gain. And the marginal gain comes from sleep. So I did some work a few years ago with the Danish Olympic team. This was before Beijing. And the Danish Olympic team, because they didn't have much money, decided to pick the 16 people who would, should win a medal. That was their team. The rest of them stayed at home because there's no point sending them. No point coming last, is there? Um, doesn't help. So they just, they just concentrated on those 16 and try to make that little bit of difference. And for many of them, that little bit of difference was getting a good night's sleep mm. uh, and seeing sleep as important. So, so you don't have to do a lot, you just need to do enough to get yeah. a good night's sleep. And then you'll find, you'll have the motivation to train. Sleep gives you motivation. You know when you feel rubbish in the morning and you feel bleary-eyed, you don't want to run. There's nothing, there's nothing worse in your mind. Why? Not because your body can't do it, because your mind can't do it. So get a good night's sleep. You will wake up. You'll think, right, yeah, great. Hit, you know, hit the street. Whatever you can do it. If you don't, then you just lie in bed and think, sorry, I'll do it. I'll do it tomorrow. That will be fine. <laughs> or, or you know, if you're an athlete, you want to eat well. Um, but if you sleep deprived you crave sugar and fatty foods. So 33% increased desire for sugar and fatty foods, 24% increased desire in overall appetite. So if you have just two nights of poor sleep on the third day, you'll eat between 400 and 1,000 calories more simply because you're sleepy, because you want to eat junk, you want to eat donuts, you don't want to eat apple. You feel miserable. <laughs> it, 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 it is. I mean, they, they did a study that actually showed that if you sleep, Again, what you need to sleep, you will consume less sugar. It's as simple as that. Mm -hmm. So trying to maintain a healthy weight or actually lose weight, and if you don't sleep well, you're fighting with one arm tied behind your back. Mm -hmm. And again, that feeds in again to, you know, if you feel a bit heavy, you don't want to exercise, etc., etc. No. Uh, we're learning stuff here. <laughs> But, but also, I guess if you're sleepy, you know, sugar is, is a natural way to get energy, isn't it? And I yeah. guess that's the supportive and, response. Yeah, it is. And that's the thing. That's the problem. Um, it's called eating for the winter that never comes. In the past, you ate a lot in the summer when food was plentiful, because in the winter, you were going to starve. And so you put on weight in the summer so you had the reserves to get through the winter. We don't have winter anymore. We have electric light and we have central heating. So our bodies are in permanent summer mode. Eat, 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 because we may starve. We just never starve. And year on year, if you have poor sleep, you will put on about half a BMI point a year. Over 14 oh. years, this study was done. So as I say, you're quite right. You need that energy from sugar. That's your body's response. So when people say, you know, uh, you know, we'll ban sweeties at the uh, you know exit to the supermarket, or we won't, you know, we'll stop children having you know coke or whatever uh, in machines, it isn't going to work. They don't want to. No child wants to drink Red Bull. They drink it because they need it because they're so sleep deprived. So that's the problem. That again, you know, if you get a good night's sleep, all of those temptations to eat unhealthily will disappear. Oh, it explains a lot, doesn't it? It does. <laughs> yeah, it does. Um, so the next question we had, and I know we've touched upon it, um, previously, it was do you need less sleep the older you get? But I know we've kind of visited yeah, we know the answers. That we already know the answers. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it's common that people feel that because the other thing that happens as we get older is our sleep may shift earlier and earlier. So you go to bed earlier, but you also wake up earlier, yeah. and that's the problem. If you're old and alone, you wake up, you feel scared, you feel vulnerable, and therefore that may be a problem. But that's a natural change. But no. We should try to get it. But the problem is, as I say, it's about that refreshment. When you're 20, you sleep deeply, you wake up and you feel great. When you're 50, you sleep 
and that's it. Basically, you you sleep. Um, and when you're 70, you think, what was the point of that? Um, it's a bit when you're 70, trying to get uh, you know deep restorative sleep is a bit like trying to get drunk by drinking shandy. You get the wet bit, but you don't get the fun bit. And drinking more of the wet bit isn't going to get you any closer to being drunk. Um, and so that's that's the problem as we get older. But it's you know whatever age you are you need to get the sleep you need or at least attempt to do that there's no you shouldn't using this as oh yeah i'm, I'm old so it doesn't matter it, it it matters just as much yeah and is there anything so as you get older is there anything you can do to help yourself get more deep sleep no unfortunately this is the cruel trick that nature plays on us <laughs> um the, the deep restorative sleep the n3 sleep the slow wave sleep usually makes up about 25% of the night and it's usually happening in the first third of the night. So that's when you can sleep through a thunderstorm. Uh, in the latter part of the night, you're either dreaming or you're in lighter stage two sleep. As we get older, we start losing that deep, slow wave sleep. And there is a sex difference in that loss. Men start losing it from the age of 35. Women from the age of 55. So... Um, <laughs> What's that fair? It's not fair. Uh, it's definitely <laughs> not fair. Um, the reason for this, very simple, is that men um, are very simple. Uh, we, we have very <laughs> limited roles in life, basically to hunt and protect. And when we get to around the age of 35, your body starts falling to bits and you're not much <laughs> used for hunting and protecting. So nature just says, right, die. Uh, you know you from a biological point of view just go to the corner and die um, whereas women of course can have babies and they need to stick around and look after babies so nature actually protects women much more so they need that deep sleep because they need to learn new things men of course by the time we're 18 we know everything about everything um, whereas women still have the capacity to learn um, so I'm going to go on this tangent the, the, re the reason for saying this is that for a man we, 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 our sleep declines relatively quickly. So a man at the age of 70 will have almost no deep sleep. So a man over the age of 60 will have worse sleep than a woman of the same age because men have been declining a lot longer. Women have only been declining for a few years. They've had their you know, hormonal ups and downs, pregnancy, menopause, but men all the time have just been going down. And this is why men's memories start going. Um, it's also why men die younger than women. Um, and as I say, it, we have, as we get older, worse sleep than women. Uh, so yeah, nature just gives up on us. Nature doesn't care about us. We are infinitely replaceable. <laughs> there you go. You heard it here first. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. You're, yeah. Um, so, why do you sometimes still feel tired after what is you'd constitute a good night's sleep? Exactly. Um, it, quantity, quality. Yeah. Have you had enough sleep? Just because you've had a good sleep, you know, one of the techniques that is used in, in people with sleep problems is something called cognitive behavioral therapy. And part of that is something called sleep restriction. So if you're in bed for eight hours and you're asleep for eight hours, you'd have a sleep efficiency of 100%. Yeah, so that's total sleep time divided by time in bed. Now, that's never going to happen. A good night's sleep for most people is, is 90%, 95%. So if you have insomnia, one of the problems may be that you're in bed too long and you're not using the whole time to be asleep. So what we do is something called sleep restriction. So we reduce the time in bed so you sleep for the amount of time that you're in bed more efficiently. Now, so what you can do is you can have six hours great sleep, not be disturbed at all, but actually you need eight hours sleep. Mm -hmm. And you're not giving yourself the ability to have that eight hours. So that's one of the reasons why you can do that. It feels tired. The other thing is, are you sleeping at the right time for you? There are larks and there are owls. Morning people, evening people. Some people are strong morning people. I'm a very strong morning person. I'll wake up at five, I'll be at my desk at six. I'll have done my day probably by half past 10 and wonder what I do for the rest of the day. <laughs> um, but pretty much the minute I come off this call, 
I should be going to sleep. Um, that I know, I say after all these years, I know that that's what I should be doing. But other people are owls, they're strongly evening people. So these people want to go to bed about one, two o'clock in the morning and they would love to wake up at nine, 10 in the morning. That's when they would naturally wish to wake up. We don't live, or we used not to <laughs> until recently, we used not to live in a world where that was permissible. Mm-hmm. You know, you, you had to get up to, go, to commute to work for nine o'clock. So you were getting up long before you naturally wanted to wake up. And that will lead to what we call sleep inertia. And sleep inertia is that feeling of grogginess and fogginess that you have for the first 20, 20, uh, 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 sorry, 15 minutes to two hours of the morning. No. So you really don't feel good. And you all know people like that who just are rubbish in the morning. Um, and, and, you know, and, that's because, as I say, they're not fitted to waking up at that time. So that can be the two things that can happen. That, you know, you're not getting the sleep you need or you're waking up at the wrong time for you. Hmm. Do you I'm, wanna... de- I'm definitely not a morning person. <laughs> <laughs> no, you're not. Um, so, obviously, people that work kind of Monday to Friday will have a a weekday routine of go to bed at a certain time, get up at a certain time. Should you then keep that same routine on weekends or if you have days off work? Yeah, you should do. I mean, the body loves routine. The body craves routine. If you think about it, our body clock runs you know, very, very precisely to 24 hours and 17 minutes. Uh, and, you know, all our you know, hormonal release, things like human growth hormone, cortisol serotonin are all released according to a circadian rhythm a 24-hour rhythm and not only that but we have old trading rhythms old trading rhythms are rhythms that are less than 24 hours so some things on a 12-hour rhythm some things on a six some things on a three and there are even things on 90-minute cycles you dream every 90 minutes whether you're awake or asleep daydreams if you allow yourself to daydream you would be daydreaming there is a 90 minute dreaming rhythm we just are awake so we don't notice it so all of these things are precisely timed and then you come along and at the weekend screw that up massively (laughs) Uh, and the biggest change that anybody can make to their sleep the most effective change that anybody can make to their sleep is to fix their wake up time seven days a week 365 days a year The reason for this is your mind and body starts to prepare to wake up 90 minutes before you wake up. So if you give your body the signal that you're going to wake up now at seven o'clock, one, that becomes a habit, and two, your body knows that it's going to wake up at seven o'clock so it can hit the ground running. Hmm. If your body hasn't got a clue when you're going to wake up on a Saturday morning, (laughs) it doesn't know what to do. It has no idea how long you're going to lie there for. (laughs) And then when you do wake up, it goes, right, so you want me to start working now? (laughs) Give us half an hour and I'll be with you. So in a perfectly ideal world, you'd also want to fix your bedtime. But that's never going to (laughs) happen. It's really just not going to. Nighttime's much more fun. You know, there's much more things to do at 10 o'clock at night than there is at five o'clock in the morning. So so you want to have a good routine. You want to have a wind down routine to tell your body, to give your body fair warning that it's time for bed to prepare. Uh, And so, you know, my my bedtime routine is always to read. Um, And even if I, you know, if I do an evening lecture and I get back home at two o'clock in the morning, I will read. Maybe not as much as I would do at nine o'clock at night, but I will read because that's my wind down. And that's my signal. It's time to go to bed. But I say that fixing the wake up time. And so essentially what happens in the week, you have that routine, as you say, because you have to get up at work. At the weekend, it all goes wrong. Mm. And then Monday morning, the alarm clock goes at yeah. and <laughs> and scares the life out of you. Um, because the body for the last two days thinks it's on holiday mode it doesn't have to get up and you just suddenly said it's monday again it goes right why didn't you tell me this earlier it's been so much easier 
So that's why we shouldn't be sleeping at the weekend. Yeah, it, it does make sense. Yeah, it? and and again, why everyone struggles to get back into routine after holiday? Yeah, or exactly. Yeah, that's that's it. You you adopt the new normal as as, as the phrase is. The two weeks yeah. is enough time to go rogue, and then you come back and bang. I say the alarm clock's there at seven, <laughs> and your body really doesn't want to hear that. It's <laughs> nothing to do with the sun, sea, and sand. It's got to do with the time. No. You know, it's great to sleep in if that's your life. But if it's not your life, then, you know, yeah. don't do it. <laughs> it's not yet. It's no. not yet. <laughs> one, one day, that's, that's the dream, yeah? Yeah. Um, so another question was, um, why do you sometimes fi find it harder to kind of get a good night's sleep or even get to sleep if you know you've got to be up at a certain time the next day? <laughs> Because you're thinking about sleep. <laughs> um, you're putting pressure on yourself. So you go into bed and you go, I must get sleep, I must get sleep, I must get sleep, I must get sleep, I must get sleep. <laughs> Why am I not sleeping? I must get sleep, I must get sleep, I must get sleep. Well, of course you're not sleeping. <laughs> or you catastrophize. If I, if I don't get a good night's sleep, or if I, don't, if I don't get a good night's sleep, if I don't fall asleep now, then I won't get enough sleep for the time I have to wake up and... Then I won't, and, and then, and then, and then, yeah. So you're arguing with yourself, or you're doing what we call panic maths. So it's half past 10, and if I don't fall asleep within the next 14 minutes, that means I'm only going to get six hours sleep. Which, why are you doing maths in bed? So really, going to sleep is like the Nike advert just do it. Um, and I say it's that expectation, it's that worry, it's that concern about the importance of sleep. The minute you accord sleep its own importance, then you're going to be fighting it. Whereas have a wind down, have a quiet mind and a relaxed body, sleep will happen. And if it doesn't happen, don't worry about it. You know, sometimes I'll wake up um, at four o'clock in the morning, which is a bit early even for me. But I lie there a bit, still don't fall asleep, so I'll switch the light on and start reading. Now, sometimes I'll read until seven and I'll finish the book. Other times I'll read two pages and collapse back into sleep. But I don't worry about it. I'm not concerned. I don't think I'm going to die the next day because I haven't had enough sleep. And that's what you have to do. Don't put pressure on yourself um, to have that, to, you know, to, I must sleep. No, you will sleep if you have a relaxed mind, a, a quiet mind and relaxed body. So that's, that's the problem. It's that expectation and the catastrophizing what might go wrong. Makes sense. We've all done it. Yeah, definitely. You're <laughs> so angry when you can't sleep. Oh. <laughs> well, this is it. You know, so the advice is if you, if, you, if you can't fall asleep within 30 minutes, Get up, go to another room and do something else and then go back to bed when you feel sleepy. There's no point. If you lie in bed, you start hating your pillow, your duvet and your mattress <laughs> and your bed partner who's asleep and therefore doesn't care about you. Um, so what's the point? If you're not sleepy, don't lie in bed. Go somewhere else. Do something quiet. And then when you feel sleepy again, then go back to sleep. S you know, Start the cycle again. But don't fret about it. And, you know, one night's poor night's sleep isn't going to kill anybody. The Americans have got a wonderful phrase, if not tonight, then tomorrow night. All things being equal, if you have a bad night's sleep tonight, tomorrow night you'll sleep well. So don't worry about it. it you know, it will all even out in the end. Hmm. That's okay. good. Okay. So is there so on that note, obviously we've we've spoken about having a good routine to relax you and, and set you up for a good bedtime. You obviously don't want to be drinking too much alcohol. Caffeine. Caffeine after definitely. two o'clock. See, we're listening. Caffeine <laughs> after two o'clock. Um, but is there anything that you can can eat and can drink which will help you into that sleep state? Uh, the, the simple answer is no. Um, you know, the, a lot of claims have been made for you know, things like sour cherries and people say eat a banana before bed because it's got magnesium in and things like that um you know melatonin tryptophan all these sorts of things 
the, the actual honest answer is that none of these things have any benefit. Just because something contains it doesn't mean that it gets into the bloodstream. And even if it does get into the bloodstream, it doesn't need to get into the brain. You produce enough melatonin yourself. You don't need sour cherries to give you melatonin. The key thing about melatonin is the dose and the time. Um, and there's only about five people in the world who I know who can tell you when the right time to take what dose of melatonin is. Just stuffing yourself full of cherries at some vague time is going to do absolutely nothing. Um, so the, the, the whole thing about food, I mean, people say avoid spicy food before bed. Well, that makes no sense because that means that there's six billion people in the world who obviously have bad sleep because they eat slightly spicier than the Western diet. Anything that disturbs your stomach will make it difficult for sleep. So if you have only ever eaten a chicken korma, then going for a chicken vindaloo isn't going to help your sleep. It's got nothing to do with the spice. It's got to do with you're a wimp in the first place. Um, <laughs> as simple as that. Um, so there's no food that you need to eat. You want to avoid eating too late. That's the key thing. Because to sleep, your body doesn't want to do anything. Giving it food to process is work. And in order to get a good night's sleep, you need to lose one degree of body temperature. You lose that temperature out of your head and face, so you need a cool bedroom. If you're burning off calories, you're producing heat mm. at a time when you're meant to be losing heat. So that's why you should have your last big meal of the day three to four hours before lights out. Now, don't go to bed hungry, but if you do need to eat before bed, then a couple of slices of hot buttered toast or Jacob cream crackers or something bland, boring that your body doesn't have to work with. With alcohol, again, alcohol is highly calorific. You know when you've had a few pints, you wake up in the middle of the night sweating. <laughs> Why? Because your body temperature's up at a time that you should be losing it. So alcohol... And a small nightcap's never done anybody any harm. If you're drinking half a bottle of Tesco's Value Scotch each night, you've probably got some problems. <laughs> Nothing to do with sleep, actually. Yes. You got problems. Sleep's not your problem. No. Sleep's not your problem there. Um, so it's a, it's about moderation. And and again, the same thing. You know, some people swear by chamomile tea or Horlicks to help them sleep. No, they're just a way of relaxing. I mean, for me, Horlicks is a hug in a mug. Yeah, it's a wind down. You know, you've got to wait for the milk to boil. You've got to wait for the drink to cool down before you can drink it. And nobody has ever done the hoovering or had a row with their partner whilst drinking Horlicks. So, you know, it's a 30 minute wind down that you unconsciously do. Oh, I'll have a mug of Horlicks. And the brain goes, all oh, right, 30 minutes time, she's going to be in bed. I know that because she only ever drinks Horlicks at that time. So it's a nice signal yeah. to you. But yeah, so there's nothing you do. If you eat a healthy, normal diet, then you will get all the magnesium, all the potassium, all the serotonin, all the tryptophan, all the melatonin, every building block you need, you will get. And those people who say eat a banana before bed, well, that's just disgusting. There's no reason for eating... If you want tryptophan, as I say, well, make no difference. But if you want to eat something high in tryptophan, turkey sandwich on white bread. Far mm. higher than a banana. And for me, that sounds like supper. A banana <laughs> doesn't sound like supper. <laughs> so you don't like bananas? I don't like bananas. <laughs> I think that is red. <laughs> The turkey sandwich with your Horlicks. Yeah, sorted. Good to go. <laughs> well, you'll be away in La La Land, absolutely. Perfect recovery food. Yeah, right. absolutely. Yeah. And and also it, it sort of crosses over with the, if you want to lose weight, you shouldn't be eating a, a big meal before, you know, before, um, before bedtime. Night, but actually, yeah. I guess it wouldn't matter if you're going to bed at midnight, then eight o'clock, if you're going to bed at nine o'clock. And five o'clock, you know, yeah, so I guess I mean, it's, yeah. that's the key, isn't it? I, I, I eat my, I mean, during lockdown, um, I, I've been eating my evening meal at five o'clock, regular as clockwork. Um, 
as I say, I, I fall asleep somewhere between nine and half past ten. But, it, you know, you don't want to, be, you know, so hopefully I've burnt most of those calories off because you don't want, you know, certainly in the summer, you don't want to be hot getting into bed. So snacking, so, you know, Friday night, Netflix is on. <laughs> grab, grab the grab the crisps, the grab the popcorn. Exactly, and this is this is it. But you're only doing that because it's comfort food, and that's the thing. It's comfort food. You've had a tough week. You want to treat yourself with eating rubbish, and I mean, yeah, everybody does it, but it's it's difficult not to. And you know, if you think about it, you know, when I was growing up, I mean, a bag of crisps was was small, <laughs> and that was it. Now you buy bags of crisps that are as big as a pillow. And the thing is, you never seem to shut them. <laughs> you go, oh, I'll save that for another day. And that's the problem. It's not, you know, it's not crisps per se. It's the fact that you keep eating the blooming crisps until, yeah. oh, yeah. they're finished. <laughs> and yeah. you suddenly realise... You've eaten your entire body weight of crisps. <laughs> and then again, I guess it's it's that whole back into that calories that's being burnt close to bedtime. Exactly. Sort of stuff, isn't it? So. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Very there interesting. You go. Have, you, have we got any more? We've had quite a we've few. Had, we've had, had a, a good response for this this talk, haven't we? Yeah. So I think we've exhausted all of those questions. So, so one thing that I wanted to ask is if you're looking at sleep analysis and and particularly with heart rate monitor technology you know it can tell it can basically tell you what you should have for breakfast and you know the lights but when it comes to sleep it gives you sort of light sleep deep sleep REM yeah. sleep REM sleep you know everybody says oh you must have as much REM sleep as possible yet it seems to be the hardest thing to to kind of get what what's your take on that well one uh, none of these uh, sleep trackers can measure light deep or REM sleep they can't. It's just impossible for them to do that. I know this because my PhD is in the technology that all of these devices use. Um, <laughs> and I was at one point the world's largest user of these. Um, but yeah, okay. What you have uh, on, in a night's sleep, you have two states of sleep. And that's non-rapid eye movement sleep and rapid eye movement sleep. Now, they're as different from each other as they are from awake. You don't notice because, of course, you're asleep. Non-rapid eye movement sleep is further divided into three stages of sleep. Stages one to three. Stage one is about three to five percent of the night. And it's the gateway into sleep. So every time you fall asleep, you'll go through this stage one sleep. And stage one is so light that if I were to wake you up in stage one sleep, you'd say, why did you do that? I wasn't sleeping. 50% of the night is spent in stage two sleep. Now, you'd think that spending 50% of a night in a stage means that stage is very important. It probably is. We have no idea why. Uh, still have no idea why it's important. But stage three, the slow wave sleep, is the most important part of sleep. Mm. Stage three sleep is when you lay down memories, when you learn new things, when it's when you release human growth hormone and all the effects that the human growth hormone has on fat and muscle regeneration and all that. That happens in deep slow wave sleep. And that's about 25% of the night. And then REM sleep, when you have your dream is about another 20 to 25% of the night. Now, I have no idea why people think REM sleep is so important. If you were to miss an entire night's sleep, tomorrow night you would make up all of your missing deep sleep and only half of your missing REM sleep. Hmm. So that's how important deep sleep is. Um, and this is why if you have a really bad night, you know, the next night you sleep like a log. Yeah. You die like that. <laughs> well, that's because you're in this deep sleep. You, you know nothing. You, 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 you hear nothing, feel nothing. You don't move. You're just in that deep sleep because you've missed it and you're making it up. REM sleep is when you have your dreams. Your dreams are about emotional well-being and emotional memories. Um, but REM sleep is 
not as important for uh, athletes or indeed anybody as that deep sleep. The problem is you can't increase levels of REM, you can't increase levels of deep sleep. You can have what you need, but you can't have more than that. You can, there's no way of having more than that. So you, if you are a person who has 23% deep sleep when you've had your best night's sleep ever, there is nothing you can do to make that 25%. The same with REM. You can get what you can. It's like, you know, I'm, I'm 197 tall. However hard I want to be, I will never crack that two meters. <laughs> never. However much I will it, it's just not going to happen. And the same with sleep. All you can do is get the best night's sleep for you. Yeah. And then you'll get all that you can have. But as I say, REM sleep is, is less important than that deep sleep. Um, and so that first third of the night, the first three, four hours of the night are absolutely key because that's where you need to have that deep sleep. So you don't want to be disturbing that first three to four hours. Um, and this is where it's important, you know, things like food or alcohol, whether it's or food, certainly where it's an immediate effect, you're going to bed with a full tummy, yeah. therefore you're burning off the calories, that's going to affect that deep sleep. Alcohol will actually improve your deep sleep if you're sleep deprived, but it will then cause terrible things to happen later in the night. Um, headache, needing to pee, sweating, that sort of thing. So as I say, the, 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 all you can do, and the, the, the thing with these trackers and that is it, it's leaving something called orthosomnia, which goes back to an answer that we had earlier about worrying about your sleep. Oh, I, I scored 69 last night. I, I must score 75 tomorrow. Oh God, I've scored 80. Oh, is that, how much better is 80 than 75? Oh, I don't know. What does 68.5 mean anyway? I don't, you know, you're getting into this mathematics and you're chasing perfection. And, you know, if you, if you imagine that you've done a really hard training session, you've worked for months and you run the London uh, marathon and you run slower than you ever did before, even though your your training was the best you've ever had, yeah. you would query that there's a there's something wrong there, and you'd worry about it. And the same thing happens when you've got numbers on your wrist. You're, you're competing against that number, but that number's meaningless. And by competing against it, you're actually going to only ever fail. So throw them away; they're useless, <laughs> absolutely useless. Your only question you ever need to ask about your sleep, how do I feel? Ask yourself at 11 o'clock every day, how do I feel? On a scale of 1 to 10. 1, I could instantly fall asleep. And 10, I'm the most awake I've ever been. I do this when I lecture. I ask people in the audience, how many of you are 10s? Nobody. How many of you are 9s? Maybe one deluded person who hasn't got a bike <laughs> think that listening to me on a Tuesday afternoon is the best thing that's ever happened. Maybe a couple of eights, but the vast majority of us are sixes and sevens. That's the problem. Yeah. Why are you doing, why are you eating healthy? Why are you exercising? And the best you can achieve is a six. <laughs> that seems a bit rubbish to me. It really does. It really seems like we're shortchanging ourselves. Just imagine mm. how good you would be if you felt great every single day. Mm. Yeah. If every day you were the best mentally that you've ever been, the sharpest you've ever, that would be brilliant, wouldn't it? It was. You'd pay money for that. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah? You know, people taking various chemicals to try and achieve that. And yet, the one thing that is scientifically proven to achieve that, you think, no, I'll watch Netflix. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. It's as simple as that. It, it, yeah. it genuinely baffles me that people spend so much money. You know, a bed. 7% of people in Britain have spent less than £100 on their bed. How much do you pay for a decent pair of running shoes? 
Absolutely. How often, you know, you, you spend a third of your life in bed. You don't spend a third of your life in your running shoes. Unless you wear them to bed. Yeah, unless you, <laughs> absolutely. Well, you get up doing your own time. Is yeah, that absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> but not, on you, our, not on our bed. No. <laughs> but do you see what I mean? Absolutely. You, don't, you know, if you've spent less on your bed than you have on your TV, then you have to ask questions. You would not buy substandard running gear. No, you no. wouldn't try and run a triathlon in a pair of flip-flops. <laughs> so no. why would you sleep in a bed that's uncomfortable yeah. so you get all of these commonsensical things that you should be doing if you don't value it and this is the problem sleep i mean you know there's a lot of american sport sleep sports people who say you know sleep is the ultimate performance enhancing drug i don't like mm. that phrase because i think that equates it with you know things that are a bit yeah. Yeah. um but it is the ultimate performance enhancer and it's as simple as that. You, you, no. you can do it or you, you, you don't. It's your choice. But if you're, you know, you will run faster. You will be able to, your, 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 your lung capacity will improve. You'll run faster. You'll, be, you'll have greater endurance. You, 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 it's as simple as getting a good night's sleep. As I say, all the other things you do come after that, not before it. That's enough ranting from me. Yeah, I mean, I, I need to go to bed, basically. <laughs> That's Thank the effect you. I have on people. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, Dr. Neil, that's been super. Yeah, it's really um, you've got a book. So yeah, I mean, we'll, we'll, we'll stick, that, stick the link yeah. um, with the video. But, yeah, but, yeah. Kind. yeah, I mean, it's called How to Sleep. Well, it came out a couple of years ago, and basically it's a no nonsense, uh, just telling you to get a good night's sleep it's not going to dress it up it's not going to promise you miracles but it will promise that you know things that you know getting a good night's sleep is a good thing and hopefully it's persuasive on that so uh, yeah yeah it, it's there but you know as i say just it's it's the best thing you can do yeah and it's free well we'll link it we'll link yeah, it in with the uh, with the video thank you very much for yeah, your time you. this evening um hopefully you haven't kept you up too late <laughs> um but yeah pleasure we will no doubt speak to you again yeah, and, and do it'll be a great pleasure thank you very much brilliant thank you, thank you. Thank have you a good night so much. Cheers.